Hello and welcome to the September 21st Jupiter Lab weekly call. Today we have 13 people on the call and please find in the uh, chat the link to the agenda. And if there is something you'd like to discuss, please add a bullet point in the agenda. And if there isn't, but you want to just record that you were here, please put your name in the attendees list. And um, with that, why don't we get started? Today, the first person on the agenda is Frederic. Hey guys, sorry I don't have video today, but I will do it. Old fashioned, uh, mostly is announcement. If I find the right tab again, sorry for that. Um, so uh, the deadline for nominating the software steering committee for the Jupyter Lab group is today. So people of the council that want to nominate someone and that haven't done it yet, they still have a couple of hours to do so. Um, and uh, after that, we'll start uh, the election uh, from the nominee list. Um, the second point is a question. Um, uh, I don't think the author of the PR is there. Um, the Lumino main menu that we are using in Jupyter Lab as an option that say that the position of the menu displayed uh, is uh, pin at the X position of the the entry. So like if you click on help, the menu for the help will be positioned as, as such that the left top corner uh, will match the left border of the help entry. Uh, that can bring trouble if the, the zoom uh, on the page is high or if the the web page uh, doesn't have lots of uh, white space. Um, so the PR is for removing that constraint to allow the menu to move uh, automatically more on the left if there is space and uh, to display the full content of the menu. Uh, it sounds like a, a good thing to do. Uh, but uh, the question uh, I raise uh, on that PR is maybe someone knows why we did that choice, the meaning that we we forced the exposition to be aligned with the uh, the entry on the main menu bar. That I don't know why we decided. Yeah, I don't know if it it is because the menu bar. In Jupyter Lab, predates the ability of having your auto repositioning of the menu, or if there are some design uh, requirements that mm, that end up with that choice. So yeah, that's the question. I may, may make a break here if somebody wants to comment. If somebody knows about that, so I was hoping Steve was on the call because he might know. But this actually is a trait that is from Lumino and Lumino defaults to drawing the menu in the same place um, probably because it's easier to reason about and more predictable if no matter what the menus end up in the same place. So it defaults to that force value being set to true but it has the option of setting it to false. So it could just be that Jupyter Lab didn't, like we didn't think about whether we wanted a different thing and we just kept the default from Lumino. I don't recall ever having made a decision to do it. I think it's more that we thought the default was sensible. So it's possible there's something more involved going on, but I don't recall it. Does anyone else on the call maybe know about this? Or if you don't know about this, does anyone have a, have thoughts about whether the menu should intelligently try to render itself in your viewport as opposed to rendering in the spot that you think it's going to be no matter what? C 
So yeah, I bet if we were doing user research and you were using two different versions and the menus have two different behaviors, you would have an opinion. I'm just trying to solicit that opinion in real time. What, so my opinion is, is Frederick's pull request is clearly vastly superior to what was there before. I mean, you don't want UI elements to be halfway hidden because your screen is skinny. Yeah, I think it seems sensible to me as well. I guess, I guess what I'm wondering is, can anyone think of a benefit to leaving it as is? Because it doesn't seem to me like there is one. I mean, actually, there's one benefit, but even that is marginal, which is suppose you wrote very sensitive tests that were counting on things in certain pixel positions. But I think even that you can guarantee by making sure there's the correct resolution for the browser that your tests are rendering in. OK, so I mean, Fred, I think to answer your question, this seems reasonable to accept. OK, great. Then I will uh, check again the PR, although there is almost nothing in it. And probably I'm going to merge it this week. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, then the last point I get uh, is uh, to, to raise the list of features for 3.5. Uh, maybe I can share my screen. Um, so. Uh, in the chat, you get the the link. Um, so for for what was listed by users, and I try to list everything in the top comments so that we have a, a summary of it. So there there is a feature by uh, to add the uh, rename a dialog at the first manual save. Um, uh, there is the the raising of the pin of Jupyter Server to allow uh, user to use Jupyter Server 2 uh, with uh, Jupyter Lab 3, uh, at least 3.5 then. Um, then backport the filtering of directories in the file browser. I'm working on finishing up the next point, like the toast notification, and I will probably do that in the additional discussion as there is a few points here today. Um, and uh, yeah, there is then this one. I think this one will be interesting to get indeed. So this is, um, this is an improvement of the single document behavior. Uh, and then there is two that are still not in the process to be done. Uh, there is one that I've hope to finish to also probably beginning of next week. It will be using the notification system. The idea is to be able to have a plugin that's uh, uh, connecting to fetch announcements from uh, Jupyter app or, uh, GitHub repository, like probably a specific one. And the idea is for us to have a way to communicate to our user database uh, in a more sensible way, like because there are users that know about the the forum or the GitHub repository, but there are plenty of users that are not familiar with all of that, that probably don't even know we have such things. So I, f I think it would be nice if we can directly have a built-in features that we can use for doing announcement. For instance, uh, when we are, we'll be closer to a, a four ver a four o version to be nice to say okay there is a new major version coming and if you want to try it you can try it and some something like that or if we want also to do a in the future a user um, like a user survey as we have done in the past it would be interesting to be able to to also use that channel for communicating with uh, our users. And finally, the last point should be easy also to tackle this, to publish a new version of Lumino 1 uh, in which the API that are, that are going to be de deprecated in Lumino 2 are tagged as such. So I think I'm, I'm, I will be able to do that too. 
Um, does anyone see something missing that they want to to be part of that list or something that seems uh, inadequate? Yeah, go ahead, Dorian. Um, for the announcement one, <clears throat> I think it depends really heavily on what the source of the announcement is. So for example, suppose we had a feature that said check for updates and it goes to PyPI to see if there's a new version of the JupyterLab package. That's the kind of thing we'd have to hide behind a setting because it's gonna talk to the public internet and by default, we shouldn't have communication with the public internet uh, but if it's things that we're shipping with the version, like here's what's new in this version, that kind of thing, that's different. That's not like communicating over the web. What what were you imagining? I was thinking about something over internet. Uh, so that we'll host, like we can use the raw GitHub content uh, to just serve a static JSON that could be fetched. And we will have control, uh, like it should probably be a specific repository in the Jupyter Lab organization that we have eye control on. And we'll use the same process of reviewing PRs and stuff like that to be able to update that JSON. And definitely using something like a, a expiration date and stuff like that to say, okay, when we published an announcement, we don't want it to be appearing for a, a year or stuff like that, of course, but that's detail to be discussed. Yeah, so I think a lot of use cases of Jupyter front ends are in air gap systems or systems where they just, they don't want communication over the web. So I think it probably ought to be behind the setting. I'm not sure. Sylvan has his hand up. What are you thinking? Did, did he did get he disconnected? <laughs> oh, I, I said, uh, I said, should we, maybe we should adapt this. Yeah. Rather than, you know, having something ad hoc based on like some online JSON that we put somewhere. Is it a backend server that's contacting the web or is it your brow your web browser itself? So it's like using fetch from within the front end client. I'm just curious. My idea would be to, to use the server so that we can make it a server config for administrator uh, managing system to be more robust. And also it will allow to be more, more customizable because the idea would be also to be able to set the the fetch URL, for example. So that's in our in an organization they could use another endpoint, like another JSON file serves at some other place to do their announcement. I think this particular one would benefit from a discussion maybe on a team compass issue or something, because um we have to have like if it's a static json file somewhere chances are very good it's not going to crash but it's not guaranteed right and if it goes down we need to make sure the front end that hits it is robust enough to fail gracefully and we also need to make sure that people with security concerns don't feel like they were caught off guard with the app quote unquote phoning home, which sometimes is how some, a feature like this is perceived, even though I imagine we wouldn't be collecting any sort of information. It still like raises the concern that, oh, you're reaching out over the web. Are you capturing my headers? Are you recording in a log file? Stuff like that. So we need to talk about some of the ramifications that this creates, but it would be nice to have a communication mechanism with our users for sure. 
Um, yeah. Wouldn't it dramatically improve your ability to know how many people are running Jupiter Lab? So it really does have a phone homey type of value. I mean, it does if we collect it, right? But our our lowest barrier to entry might be to refuse to collect any information like that so that we don't have to give you a GDPR warning where you have to agree to anything. If we use no cookies and we record no data, we don't have to ask for permission. It's it's just a resource you're hitting. So yeah, basically there's there's some technical constraints here, but there's more social and legal ones that off the cuff, I'm not sure how to reason about, which is why I think a discussion might help us here. Yeah, go ahead. And one other thing I was just thinking about how this will be used by CoCalc because we host a lot of Jupyter Lab instances that are in projects. And it's for us, it's really annoying if our users are getting upgrade um, notifications and information because they can't actually do the upgrade. Uh, we have to do that. So it's so really, it's our responsibility to do the upgrade. Um, so it's kind of like, it's just, it's information we would want to disable because we don't want to confuse them or tell them to do things that they're not allowed to do. So um, yeah, definitely for, basically managed yeah. systems. You don't want to have these warnings popping up on your users. We could also have categories and let uh the admin you know allow for i don't know uh, sort of community announcements or whatever and not for grade notifications yeah i will open uh, an issue so that we can discuss and exchange id on that because would it be possible <laughs> would it be possible to have some kind of polling mechanism or actually uh it's a front end like it, it not necessarily a front-end plugin, but like some plugin that does the polling and we doesn't get push notifications. Uh, the idea was to go for something simple at the beginning. <laughs> like to I mean, it doesn't have over. to be complicated. It would just be instead of yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it, it's also there's a lot of angles where you could come at this and have questions. So suppose you're using the uh, French language version of Jupyter Lab. Do we want announcements to come in multiple languages? Do we want to request with a language uh, URL, request with a language header? Do we only support one language? There's, there's a bunch of like version one obviously won't have all the bells and whistles, but there will probably be questions we need to think about a little more. Um, okay, cool. So it says here in the agenda that the goal was to finalize that list today is that right Fred? yeah is there someone on the call who has any um features that they thought belong on a 3.5 that wasn't there okay cool um thanks a lot i will i will remind you folks again if there's something you'd like to discuss please add to the agenda because i am next and then there is no one after me on the agenda um yeah i had two updates so um the lumino 2 project is coming along um there is there is a sort of outstanding question in my mind on a piece of it that I've been working on, which is um, what the underlying mechanism that the luminal message loop uses to schedule its messages should be. So there originally was a function that detected whether you're in the browser or not. And if you were in the browser, it would use request animation frame. 
And if you are not in the browser, it would use set immediate, which is a non-standard thing that exists in Node and existed in IE and Edge for a while. I don't know if it still does. Um, request animation frame is more performant than hitting set timeout zero. And it is more apt for what the message loop is for. Luminal messaging can be used as a generic message queue, but the way we use it is uh, the way to send messages through the graph of interdependent widgets. And so like, here's a resize fit message. Here's an update request message. Here's an on after attach. Here's a on before detach, those sorts of things. And so because of the way that it's used, it is apt to use a request animation frame because they're almost inevitably things that are rendering on the screen. But um, request animation frame calls all get enqueued in the background if your tab, if your browser tab is a background tab like if your document's hidden basically. And um, there aren't that many widgets that I know of, except things that might have streaming data coming into them that are constantly um, sending messages. Those messages are usually in response to some user action or some life cycle action, like the page was loaded, et cetera. So, uh, if you, the reason this came up is because a, uh, an administrator who has a large Jupyter Hub instance, um, which had slow loading versions of lab because of either network or extensions or whatever reasons, it was slow loading enough that many users would hit the page, then switch tabs, do some other stuff, then come back to the tab and find that it hadn't rendered because all of those request animation frames were being deferred until later. Um, so their proposal was just use set timeout, but I think they picked the wrong spot to do set timeout. They thought it was the set timeout in the poll class because we do have some polls, but the polls do things like, you know, update the file browser. They're not doing rendering the way the message loop is. And also using set timeout, means that for the times when you're looking at the screen, it's slightly slower than the request animation version, request animation frame version was. So uh, so yeah, I, I've, I've been thinking about what the API for this should be, whose responsibility it should be, whether it ought to be the message loop, figuring out the document is hidden and automatically switching. And then when it automatically switches, Vidar pointed out that you might actually end up with messages in the wrong order. If you have a request animation frame that's been deferred and a set timeout that came after it that is not deferred. And so that means if you want to switch these modes, you have to flush the message loop, which is okay, but it's work. Checking the document visibility state itself is work. And so, yeah, I don't know. I'm a little bit slow moving on this one because it's not merely implementation details. It's APIs that people are going to consume. So I want to make sure they are sound in design. Um, this will be in Lumino 2 final, whatever version of it we land on. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I have to say about Lumino 2 right now. Um, Piyush messaged earlier and said he wanted to take a look at writing some tests because many packages have minimal tests, <laughs> which is how we ended up with regressions that nobody saw because everything built and the tests all passed. So I'm really grateful that he's working on that. Uh, there's still a long list of nice to haves, not blockers for releasing Lumino 2. Um, and a couple that we really do want in. So if you do want to work on this piece of the stack, I would, I would highly encourage you to, and I would definitely help you out. Um, 
Yeah, that's my Lumino 2 update. I'll move on to governance next, unless there's a Lumino question. Okay. As far as governance, um, Fred already brought up that uh, the deadline for nominating a member of the Jupiter Lab Council to stand for election to be our software steering council representative is uh, uh, today. And we want to have picked our representative by October 3rd. So I guess sometime tomorrow or Friday, I'll probably uh, work with Fred to figure out how to create a ballot. Um, if it turns out we have like only two nominations or fewer, then we probably don't need to create a ranked choice ballot. But the governance states we should use ranked choice if there's two or more. So we'll do that. Um, and I haven't done this yet because I ran out of time, but I'm going to, if you're into this stuff and curious, I'm going to post an, a pinned issue in the GitHub slash Jupyter slash governance repo that has the timeline for the transition. The TLDR version of that is we're targeting December 5th for the transition to be finished. That means that the Jupyter Executive Council by that point, we're hoping we'll have the full six people in it and that the Software Steering Council will have begun meeting. So we wanna pick the reps by October 3rd, but we don't think October 3rd is gonna be an SSC meeting. We're gonna to have to figure out how to actually, what the mechanics of that are. And crucially, it is the date that the current Jupiter Steering Council and the current benevolent dictator for life, BDFL, Fernando, um, step down. So uh, yeah, I'll put that issue up. Uh, today or tomorrow. So if you're curious and you want to follow along, there's just uh that'll just be a timeline. Um yeah, any questions about that stuff? All right. Um cool. We have an offer to do a demo in the additional discussion section. Great. Let us jump to that. Fred, is that you? Yeah, this is me. Cool. Um, so I'm hacking at the same time, so I may eat the demo <laughs> fresh. <laughs> uh, but um, let's present it a bit. So uh, if taken over the PR that uh, Max started to add a notification um, in Jupyter Lab uh, to speak about uh, a bit how it, this is done. Um, so uh, what this PR is adding is a, a global object that's a queue of notification and a user will be able to um, to just use helpers to push new notification to the queue. And this means that uh, you don't need to ask for a token, stuff like that. So uh, why I did that is from experience of the Toast uh, extension. Uh, you, like, I found it annoying to have to, to bring down to very sometimes very deep part of the code uh, the notification uh, capability so uh, i think it's easier if you just have a global helper function that you can call and that sends notification uh, but that said uh, the idea is to still allow people to activate or deactivate plugin so um, that global um, that global uh, Q is only a Q. He has nothing uh, about uh, UI. Uh, so if I just show quickly the code as of today, um, so we have, don't hesitate if it's too small, can be up. 
So the idea is really like we get a notification manager. He has only only a queue. Um, you you have a dismissed uh, function to remove a notification from the queue. You have a notify to add a notification to the queue. You have an update to update an existing notification, and you have a change signals to be able to listen for changes. And that's that's uh, that's all it is. Uh, this uh, object and so this object is uh, uh, instantiate independently of any plugins, but it doesn't bring any UI. So uh, in addition to that, I'm creating a plugin for notification, and uh, so that's what you're gonna see for now in the demo. Uh, and uh, in addition to some UI elements, I also have defined uh, comments as suggested by Max to be able to also create new notifications from any uh, common execute uh, a call. And you can also dismiss notification with a comment. Um, and the nice thing about it is that I can use that for testing. <laughs> uh, so it's what I would do. So in the UI for now, what you can see is that there is a new uh, belt on the right bottom corner and there is a number it's the number of notification in the queue i did that because it's uh, similar to uh, what we are displaying for kernels and uh, and terminals and it's also similar to what we are showing the user if they have the log console open is what will uh, will appear in the in the status bar for the log console so that's why i choose that pattern and so if i use the comments to trigger a notification, this is how it looks like. Um, so you you can define the type of the notification you want. So there are success, error, warning, default, info, and uh, in progress. Um, uh, so um, if I trigger other kind of thing, they will to show a bit what they look like. So that's how in progress is looking. Um, so you can specify the message. Uh, the, the idea is to have message that are only string, but that can be marked down so that user can add link if they want in it. Uh, and you can add buttons. Uh, buttons, they can, uh, they can have a callback. Uh, that can be anything if the notification is triggered programmatically. And if they are triggered from uh, the comments, the button will only be able to trigger another comments uh, to respect the fact that uh, arguments of a comments can only be JSON. Uh, so for instance, the click me button here will trigger a new toast. That's the demo I've done. Um, so that's how the notification can look like if you ask them to be visible to the user because by default, they won't be. So if I do another one, I will just change an option. So I have done a notification. What changed is like the, the core of the background of the, the status widget has changed to say, OK, there is a new notification, but there hasn't been any pop-up. That's the default behavior. The idea is to avoid uh, showing too much pop-up uh, to the user. And so the user can access all notification by clicking here. So there are still lots of CSS stuff to do, but <laughs> work in progress. So uh, in which you can see the um, all the notification um, that are that have been emitted. Uh, yeah, that's what I've been doing for the last couple of days. And uh, so uh, don't hesitate to to look at the API and uh, provide comments uh, how to improve it or raise question and, and stuff like that it's uh, it's uh, i think uh, features that that is missing and that lots of people are waiting for and so it would be good if we can have a, a good api that's uh, flexible enough for that kind of thing so don't hesitate to comment on the PR, and I think I forget to add the link to the PR in the additional description. So I will do that just right now yeah. when you are asking question. 
Can you update the text of an open notification? I was thinking specifically about the progress one. Um, you might want to update the, 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 the message that is showing as things are progressing. Um, also, this is awesome. Uh, so yes, you can update uh, an existing notification. I did not create a comments for it, so I cannot live demo it, <laughs> but you can, yeah. Because uh, for instance, uh, uh, so the extension that uh, these features take inspiration from uh, was used for the Gator extension that allows to manage uh, Conda environment in uh, JupyterLab. And so uh, that was our mandatory features to be able to pop up uh, a notification that say, okay, you have a new environment that's uh, that's being created and to, to say, okay, it, it fails or it succeeded. So that, that's, that's something, uh, that's a feature circuit. And I even uh, used uh, one of the new features that uh, the underlying Toast library has, it's the ability also to, to define a promise. promise. So uh, if you provide a promise and then you can specify which text you want for the pending status, which, which then which one we want for success and which one you want for error. And so everything will, uh, will be updated uh, depending on the status of the promise you, you are passing by. Oh, that's cool. Um, would you consider moving this into its own package instead of having it in app utils? Uh, yeah, I don't have a strong opinion where it should live. It's just my guess is that it might migrate out of app utils one day into its own package because some things start there and then they move out. Um, but I don't, I don't have a strong feeling about this either. It's more that uh, it's just clearer from looking at the code base when it's somewhere else. But I don't know, what, 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 what do you think? There is maybe one question about the global queue. Uh, that if we move it out, I don't know, like <laughs> that's mean that uh, extension that are using it, if a, a, a remix of JupyterLab is not providing that specific package, then that may bring some additional trouble. I don't know, like in Webpack Federation, what will happen in that case, <laughs> but <laughs> that may be a corner case. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Any other questions, comments on this feature and demo? I'm gonna take that as a no. Cool, thanks for showing this. You're welcome. Um, all right, I will stop the call now. Sorry, stop the recording rather, in case there's anything anyone wants to say um, off the call, off the recording, if I can find the button. All right, brace yourselves.